Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all with us this afternoon, as well as moderate this great conversation we're going to have with Dr. Sarah Lynn Mark on precision innovation. But before I do that, there are just a few folks we want to say thank you to. They are our premier sponsors, without whose help uh, Explore Mars and bringing you these great programs would not be possible. We want to say a special thank you to Aerojet Rocketdyne, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Boeing Company, and the Phillips Company. Again, a great thank you for their support and underwriting that, again, helps us to bring these great programs to you. Uh, another reminder for all of you out there, January 19th, we will have a Drinks with Explore Mars that is at 8 p.m. Eastern, and that will be with Kelsey Goad. She's with Space.com, and I'm thinking that by the middle of next week, you guys all may want to join us and uh, say salud and enjoy some time with your space family. So please join us January 19th, 8 p.m. Eastern for Drinks with Explore Mars. We also have a fantastic happening this weekend. Uh, whether or not uh, the world is as we would all want it to be, uh, there is something fantastic almost every month of this year happening in space, and Saturday is no exception. The SLS will have one of its most historic green test run. The success of this event on Saturday will be that moment in time when we are surely on our way back to the moon and on to Mars. We will be live streaming from all of our platforms, so you can find us anywhere uh, that you normally kind of visit or connect with Explore Mars, but we will be having a watch party and all eyes on the SLS. So we are wishing the team of that has put all of those compartments and uh, things together uh, great success and good luck on Saturday. But again, tune in, find us uh, on any live stream where we will be, and that is at 4 p.m. Eastern. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce not only my colleague, but my friend. It's an it's an amazing thing, Dr. Mark Howe. Space does indeed unite us, <laughs> even, via, uh, even via something virtual. But <clears throat> let me tell you a little bit about not only my colleague, but my friend, Dr. Sarah Lynn Mark. She's an expert on space medicine, and she's a world-renowned leader in women's health. She's an endocrinologist, a geriatrician. I can't even say that word right. How do you say that word? Geriatrician. That word, that and word. women's health specialist. She created the first women's health fellowship in the United States. Uh, she's also president and CEO of Solomed Solutions. She served as a medical and scientific policy advisor for four different administrations, including in the White House Office on Science and Technology. Uh, She's also uh, kind of been a policy advisor to the Office of Women's Health, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and other organizations that are dedicated to improving health on Earth and in space. Uh, in August 2019, I had the great pleasure of watching her testify before the Space Council. Uh, and her talk was all about focusing on gendered innovation for human exploration. And uh, she's developed and led two NASA decadal reviews on the impact of sex and gender on adaptation to space. And these decadal reviews have fostered some amazing policies and programs that have already been part of improving the health of our astronauts. She's the president of iGiant, and I know we've got a few of her iGiant ambassadors watching today. It is the only nonprofit that is accelerating gender gendered innovation in the world. Uh, they've hosted five roundtables, one of which I've been able to be a part of, two challenge competitions, and uh, they've got much more planned, including a podcast called Stellar Medicine that is going to premiere in February. So we'll update you with more about that. Her doctoral and academic appointments are include Yale and King's College London uh, and the Center for Human and Aerospace Physiology. She is the author of Stellar Medicine. If you don't have a copy, go and pick one up. It is a journey basically through the universe of women's health. And it also chronicles her adventures uh, with the space program and her journey across all seven continents 
continents. And uh, she has published and delivered over 700 lectures. And in the last year, she may have become a real familiar face as she has led the COVID-19 for the American Medical Women's Association. She's appeared on Fox, MSNBC, uh, Sky News, Forbes, and Business Insider uh, with also helpful ideas about how to combat uh, and to protect ourselves in this pandemic. Uh, there are so many other things that I could say about my dear friend, but I want to give you the time, Dr. Mart, to enlighten us on this idea of precision innovation in medicine for all. Great. Thank you so much, Janet. And I want to ex uh, extremely thank Explore Mars for inviting me to be part of your, your kickoff for 2021 and to have the opportunity to talk to you about precision innovation and why it's so important for space exploration. Explore Mars has been an amazing champion for iGiant since our inception. Chris Carberry has been at many, many of our events. Uh, Janet, we've actually had over 80 roundtables and five summits and five challenge competitions and Explore Mars has been such an amazing partner throughout all of this. I think it's important when we talk about precision innovation, we, we have to first ask ourselves, why is that important? How has it come to be? I know in the age of COVID, we have begun to appreciate how social determinants of health or in NASA parlance, human factors or FDA lexicon, subpopulation demographics play a role. And what do I mean by that? You know, we define ourselves by age, race, sex, gender, even in socioeconomic status. We know all of that plays an important role in how we live our lives. And certainly as we take the deeper dive, we see the role of sex and gender. So what I wanna do very quickly is just define sex and gender for our audience. And I use the National Academy of Science definition. Gender is really the psychosocial construct, how one sees oneself as male or female or how they identify themselves. And sex is more of the biological construct. We know the definitions are a lot more complicated. You know, we see as we interact with the environment, the environment's interacting with us and certainly influencing our genome. We call that epigenetics. And that influences how we perceive the world and how sex and gender play a role in our lives. For our talk today, let's talk about sex and gender. And I think, you know, as we talk about precision innovation, we've talked for many years about personalized medicine and precision medicine. And we know that plays such an important role. We certainly see it with COVID. We see it with space exploration. We see it in so many aspects of our lives. Now, you, you mentioned that I had the, the honor to testify in front of the National Space Council back in August uh, in 2019, seems like many, many moons ago. And I introduced the concept of gendered innovation and design with this paragraph. And I just wanna share it with our audience today. I said that gender and sex impact every aspect of our lives on earth and in space. It's more than spacesuits not fitting female astronauts. We see the impact from the shoes and clothing we wear, the electronic devices we use, the cars we drive, and even the medications we take. Modifying appearances or the pink it, shrink it approach for gendered innovation will never work in any environment, including space, battlefields, hot zones, and in our homes. And who would have thought back then that the hot zones would have been in our homes? So we know that we really have to take that deeper dive to understand how sex and gender impacts our life on earth and in space. I had the privilege also to work with NASA for over 18 years. And I've always found it an exciting place to be because as the body adapts in space, you're able to discern very small changes which have extremely important impact. And certainly we've begun to appreciate the role of sex and gender and our adaptation to space. As you mentioned, we've held two uh, NASA decadal reviews um, to really assess how the body adapts. Because we know the changes that we see on Earth from sex and gender certainly follow us into space. And then as the body adapts in space, that's just compounded. And we need to understand these changes so that we can develop the resources and the tools so that we can live and work well in any environment, including in space. So for the sake of time today, I have a PowerPoint presentation. I'm doing it as a video presentation for our virtual environment, which will explain a little bit how and why iGiant, again, that acronym for Impacted Gender and Sex on Innovation and Novel Technologies developed. It's a nonprofit. It's an accelerator for gendered innovation design across health, IT, transportation, and the retail sectors. And then we'll have plenty of time for questions from our audience. So let's go ahead and roll that tape. 
Hello, I'm Dr. Sarah Mungmark, founder and president of iGiant. iGiant's an acronym for the impact of gender and sex on innovation and novel technologies. And I want to thank the conference organizers for the invitation to join you today. I wish we could be together in person, but I hope in the near future that will happen. I will be sharing with you information about gendered innovation and how it plays a role in our daily lives, including with COVID-19. Before I start, I have nothing to disclose. I have no content to disclaim, and I am not using any off-label or investigational use in this presentation. Let me give you a brief history of iGiant. I worked as a senior scientific policy advisor in the Obama White House. During my tenure, we were experiencing an Ebola outbreak. We were also launching a precision medicine initiative. And I was also working at NASA as a senior medical advisor. And we had just published the second decadal review to look at the impact of sex and gender on how the body adapts in space. It became very clear to me that we needed to focus a great deal on gendered innovation, gendered inclusive design, so I developed the blueprint, which became iGiant. I launched iGiant after I left the White House because I did not want to politicize the issues that we were going to address. Over a period of just a few short months, many roundtables percolated across the United States focusing on iGiant and gendered innovation. When I talk about a roundtable, I'm talking about an event which allows individuals to one, discuss any activities that they have that has a sex gender focus. So basically sharing best practices, as well as allowing individuals to go back to their respective organizations and agencies and institutions to become ambassadors for gendered innovation. In a very short period of time, in just over a year and a half, a, the iGiant evolved into a 501c3, a nonprofit. And we are basically the only non profit accelerator for gendered innovation across health, IT, transportation, and retail sectors in the world. The mission of the iGiant is to accelerate the translation of research into gender and sex specific design elements, such as products, programs, policies, and protocols. The vision is to improve the safety and quality of life, including work performance for men and women. I like to say for everyone in every environment on earth and in space, now, we often use the terms male, female, men, women, boys, girls. I really want us to take a non-binary approach when we talk about gendered innovation so that we have a more inclusive approach to these issues. Now, my next few slides talks about women's health research. And we have a very long history. I went back to 1977, and we are familiar with the thalidomide and DES tragedies and how women were barred from clinical research. For the purpose of time, I'm not going to go through this extensive timeline, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it because you were but some seminal moments, such as the NIH Revitalization Act in 1990, which signed into NIH now required in all clinical trials, an analysis of results by sex for phase three clinical trials. And as you can see, not only was the NIH involved, but the General Accounting Office, the FDA, and there was a review back in 2000, 2001, which also showed the progress that we made and the miles that we needed to go. And in the next slide, you can see that we made significant progress but we also knew that we needed to require sex as a biological variable to be factored into research designs, analysis, and reporting in vertebrate, animal, and human studies, including preclinical studies back in 2016. In the next slide, I think this is a report that all of you are probably very familiar with, and this was a real milestone watershed moment. It was an Institute of Medicine report exploring the biological contributions to human health does sex and basically, we knew that every cell has a sex, sex begins in the womb, and sex affects behavior and perception. Basically, it impacts health. And this was a very, very important uh, report because it allowed many agencies to now begin to adopt new policies, including at NASA. In this next slide, if we had time, I would show you a wonderful uh, video that was pioneered by Stanford University looking at innovation design. And I've often used this very brief video to describe to the general public how gendered innovation design impacts every single aspect of life. So 
instead of showing the presentation due to time today, let me just ask you some more important questions. Have you ever taken a medication that just wasn't the right dosage for you? I know for myself I have. I often tell a story of how I had taken a medication uh, on a trip to the WHO, and it really basically sedated me for, for days, and it was the wrong medication dosage. Um, wearing, second question, have you ever worn shoes or boots that didn't quite fit? I often use that because I describe my own experiences where I'm a climber, and I had to get new boots, I was given boots that was really told to me that it was designed to fit a woman's foot. Unfortunately, after I wore them, I then tore the ligaments in my midfoot when I started walking in my natural day shoe. And that really, again, was an eye-opening moment, realizing that we often market shoes and boots to fit women's feet, but we're really not looking at a woman's gait, we're not looking at the cue angle, we're not looking at how she ambulates. Another question is, have you ever experienced repetitive stress injury just by using your electronic devices? And I think this issue is so important today as all of us are wired to every device that we have around us, such as what we're even doing now. And we see repetitive stress issues. And then finally, have any of you ever sustained neck trauma in a car accident? We know that women have uh, less muscular muscle strength in there. We know that car seats are really designed more for the male body. And certainly the position of a, of a human being in the cockpit or in the cabin of a vehicle will relate to how they may sustain injuries in car accidents. In fact, uh, there was a report in 2012 published by the American Journal of Public Health that showed that women sustained 47% more severe neck injuries in car accidents. So with all that, when I designed the blueprint for the eye giant, I thought it was important to focus on these four sectors, health, information technology, as well as transportation and retail. And just taking it back to a moment, let's talk about COVID-19. We are seeing across the globe that men are twice as likely to die from COVID-19 compared to women across all age groups. We also see that more women on the front lines as far as being essential workers and frontline workers are becoming infected. In fact, 73% of the workforce that's infected are women. And we believe that it's because the PPE does not fit. As I described during Ebola, I saw women who were donning and doffing their gowns infecting themselves. We know that gowns may not fit. We know the N95 respirator mask may have a problem with fit for women. And it's, it's not just size and shape. It's really how the woman moves. And we need to be clear that you can't just kink it or shrink it and think that you're going to get the best fit. So the next slide focuses on health. And I, I want to take it now from Earth and dealing with COVID-19 to what we saw with NASA and our sex and gender decadal review. Basically, this graphic shows that every single system in the body adapts in space. And in the body, you can see in space these very dramatic change, changes as we adapt happen very quickly and again very dramatically. And if we had more time, I would go through every single system, but we have a wonderful publications in the Journal of Women's Health which delineate how the body adapts. I do have to say that we see men and women have different reactions to radiation exposure, as well as the cephalic distribution of fluid, basically the blood that flows from the legs to the brain. And we also are seeing a syndrome, a space-associated neurosensory syndrome, where there's visual impairment and intracranial pressure. And interestingly, it's more common in men than in our female astronauts. In regard to drug toxicity, um, I had mentioned my trip to the WHO, and in 2013, the FDA approved uh, new label changes and dosing for sulfadin products and a recommendation to, uh, to really avoid driving um, the day after using this product. And it really uh, showed that men and women metabolize drugs very differently. The pharmacokinetics and dynamics need to be filtered into any safety and efficacy study. And again, coming back to COVID-19, as we're looking at therapeutics, we need to think about that. And certainly with vaccines, we know that women um, have very robust immune systems. They tend to be more resistant to infection. Uh, but then once they're infected, they mount very, very robust responses. So this may account for why men may have higher mortality rates after infection. But if there is any uh, advantage to this, potentially women may need less dosage of a vaccine to have an efficacious response.
In regard to information technology, this is a really interesting area. We know that women have greater tactile sensation in their fingertips compared to men, so the devices don't seem to read when a woman's pushing down. It's almost as if she's wearing mittens on a very cold day. So what ends up happening is you have to push harder and harder over and over again, resulting in repetitive stress injury. In regard to COVID-19, we are all wired again to our devices, and then certainly with electronic medical record, we see gender bias. Um, Dr. Burnett, who will be on the panel with me, will talk about her program, Gender Mag, which goes into further detail about how gender bias can impact how one uses even the electronic health record and how day in, day out, that can result in increased exhaustion and burnout for female clinicians. Let's look at transportation for a moment. I mentioned to you the National Highway Safety Transportation Administration's report. And you know, we see it with the way a seatbelt goes across the chest, we see it with the headrest, we see it even with women sustaining greater foot injuries in cars because they're not airbags in the lower part of the car and often women are wearing soft shoes or open toe shoes. Interestingly, with COVID-19, I think a lot of us are exercising at home, for example. I know I have just recently acquired an exercise bike and it was designed supposedly for a woman, but I know that my behind doesn't fit the seat. And we see this. We see this in transportation with the seats and cars. We see it in bicycles. And it can result in more injury and difficulty doing what you want to do. The next slide, which is stated gender branding, um, shows the retro barefoot um, caravan. And I actually, I, I find it quite cute. And recently, again, with COVID-19, I acquired a travel trailer so that I could get out into the outdoors and, and be a bit isolated, continue my social distancing. But what was interesting was this uh, caravan that uh, was uh, developed in the UK and has come over to the States um, was using the female the female caravan, the female travel trailer, because it had this cute design. And it reminds me of the Volkswagen Beetle. And it, what ended up happening is that it became very difficult to sell these products across the gender spectrum because it was gender branded immediately. Let's go down into retail. I talked to you initially that PE has been designed really for the average man. And imagine if you're wearing an N95 for 8, 10, 12 hours a day and it doesn't fit your face, not only does it put you at risk, but it's uncomfortable. And many women have complained of abrasions as well. So we really do need to have a better design uh, for our PPE, for our face masks, for our boots, for our gloves. Uh, women who were on the front of our bolo were talking about having to duct tape their gowns and their gloves, and again, putting themselves at risk for contamination when they're donning and doffing their gowns. Um, this slide goes a little bit more into the impact of retail and the role of ergonomics. It's not just that you are alone in the environment. We have to understand how you interact with your environment. We're seeing a lot of injuries, neck, shoulder injuries now, as people are sitting at their desks and, and their chairs are really designed for a way a man sits and for the height of a man. So again, taking a look at every aspect of your environment will influence what you see and how you're going to be able to do your jobs. As I mentioned, iGiant Roundtables um, were designed to empower individuals to share their best practices. And as we became a nonprofit, we have launched roundtables all across the globe. We've had also summits, which are specialty roundtables. We've had them on artificial intelligence, space, held one at NASA. Um, we've had one for the extreme environment. We held it with first responders after the Las Vegas shooting. Um, we had it at Nellis Air Force Base. And we had a recent design roundtable at Google. And we've had over 75 to date. Um, what I have really enjoyed is that they are very interactive. I call them PowerPoint free zones. Um, and what's nice is that they can now be held virtually. We've in fact have held five uh, virtual roundtables since the pandemic spot started. And I encourage every one of you to consider hosting a roundtable. We will provide you the tools and resources. All you need to do is invite your community. Let me just show you the iGiant structure. We have a board of directors. We have an outreach community as well as having a corporate advisory council. But in the arms of that triangle, we also have a design advisory council, which Dr. Margaret Burnett is part of. We also have scholars in residence and youth ambassadors who are engaging our students as well. And we have a seal of approval, which Dr. Burnett helped us to pioneer so that organizations and companies that take a sex gender look for their products can actually brand um, their processes as being gender inclusive designs.
As you can see from this next slide, we have many different outcomes across all our design elements, across our programs, our protocols, our products, and our policies. And we just want to continue day in and day out to ensure that we see success and we see these outcomes so we can improve the lives of everyone. Um, one future policy improvement I just have to share with you, and I know it's one that we've all complained about, is being in air conditioning, for example. And as you go into in the olden days, when you would go into work sites, you would see women wearing scarves and, and sweaters in the middle of the summer. And part of that is because um, the, air, the ambient air temperature was set for men. And men, we know, tend to wear long sleeves, jackets, ties, and they also have a higher metabolic rate. And so, again, just a real pertinent question, women freezing in their offices how does that impact work performance? So something as simple as that, you can see it can have profound impact on how well you do. I'm listing some of our iGiant activities here. One is uh, iGiant challenges. We've launched our fifth challenge. We've had some really exciting um, innovation. Um, our first one actually was the design of uh, spacesuits that fit men and women, a little bit ironic. The individual won a, an award, a prize, and that was an object flown on the space station. We also hosted one with uh, students, over a quarter million students, and the winning design was for new hospital gowns to fit men and women. So you can see it really goes across the gamut. We have many giant champions. This is a partial list of some of them. And we are so grateful to everyone coming on board and really becoming our giant champions. And I often believe um, with gender equity, if you build it, they will come. Some of you may recognize these scenes from some classic movies. In the beginning, we had a lot of individuals talk about gender equity, and often I would try to pivot, and then I realized it is so sentinel, so important to what we're discussing here. If you do not provide the resources, the opportunities, and the tools, careers will rot on the vine. So we believe that as employers provide these resources, opportunities, and tools, they'll be more inclined to recruit individuals, and individuals will be more inclined to stay. So finally, I just want to thank you so much, and I hope that everybody will be able to see that it is time to see the world through a gender sex lens. My contact information is on the slide and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Again, you are so marvelous. Anytime I hear you speak, I learn something new. I, I think what is so exciting to me, uh, uh, Dr. Mark, is just that that you have brought these issues to the table. And again, it's becoming even more apparent how much we need to do this. Let's go to uh, one of my things that I, I would love for you to share with everybody. Name just a few differences. You talked a little bit about the differences that happened in, men Finally, in, I just want in space, but it's like one of the things that I really want, give me some examples. Don't women's blood pressure is lower uh, or <laughs> our heart rates are higher. Tell yeah. us those things that happen. Well, thank you for that question, Janet. And that's what I was hoping would happen. We would have plenty of time to take that deeper dive again into some of these sex differences. When we uh, launched our decadal reviews, we looked at six work groups that correlated with the different uh, uh, systems in our body. So from muscular, skeletal, cardiovascular, neurosensory, reproductive, behavior, even immunological. So let's just highlight across the board very quickly a few of them from each of those different uh, body systems. So when you look at the muscular skeletal system, we know on earth that women are more likely, four times likely to have osteoporosis basically loss of bone compared to men and there are various reasons for it. And that can result in bone fracture. What we see in space is that as you go into space, you begin to leach calcium from your bones and it happens actually very quickly. So within just a few weeks, you can learn, lose significant bone. So if you think about the differences that men and women have on earth and then you go into space, it gets compounded. Now what's interesting is there's a great deal of diversity on how people lose muscle and lose bone, but we have to understand the lessons here so that we can translate how to keep bone healthy people's muscular skeletal health, you know, healthy in space. You look at the cardiovascular system, you talked about blood pressure. That's a really interesting area. We see that women have a greater chance of developing what we call orthostatic hypotension, just sort of a, a nice word for when you stand up, your blood pressure drops and you feel faint. And we know that there are a lot of volume shifts in the body. I mentioned it in our presentation that there's cephalic distribution of blood flow, everything's flowing up to the head. And we have ways to compensate. Men tend to vasoconstrict, women tend 
to increase their heart rates. And I think the hormonal milieu, again, estrogen and testosterone play a role in that. And that can be an issue. If you're landing on a surface that has gravity, whether it be Earth or you go to one sixth gravity or three eighths gravity on Mars, um, you need to be able to egress get out of your vehicle and be able to do what you need to do. So we need to be really conscious of why there are those differences and what we can do to control it. You know, we see just on earth, for example, men and women have different symptoms in, in regard to heart attacks where they may not have that crushing chest pain. It may be nausea and vomiting. So we know we have to be attuned here on earth and we certainly have to be attuned on, in space as well. In regard to behavior health, that's a really interesting area. You know, we've, we've selected such superstars to go into space and I'm really excited that as we're democratizing space, basically through our commercial space sector, we're gonna open it up to everybody. But we have to understand every aspect, and that includes behavior health and mental health issues. We know on Earth, women are about a quarter more likely to be diagnosed with, um, with depression, but unfortunately, only about a quarter appropriately diagnosed and treated. And so we need to understand how men and women adapt to their environments, psychosocial issues, how they interrelate with each other, and be able to develop um, models so that we help everybody do very well. In regard to neurosensory, I mentioned it early on, the space associated neurosensory sensory syndrome. Um, again, there's changes in the eye structure. We see fluid shifts in the brain. Men tend to be more symptomatic. We're trying to understand the etiology of that so we can prevent this from happening or to try to mitigate it. You know, it's interesting on earth, um, we see that the woman what men and women's brains are, are are different in the sense that corpus callosum, that little highway between each hemisphere, very, very, very busy in women. And men tend to focus using more of one hemisphere. What are some of the correlates to that? Well, we see women tend to do better after a stroke. They tend to regain the use of speech a little faster. Um, again, processing is different. So the neurosensory aspects, you know, as we're seeing, for example, with COVID, with taste and smell, we see that men and women have acoustic changes differently on earth. And that will certainly translate in space. Whereas men age, they tend to lose the ability to hear women's voices, which is interesting because they're losing that decibel range. And I often say it's a way that we can all uh, stay together. It's an evolutionary you know, mechanism, but you know, it's a fascinating aspect and, and we need to understand that. Immunologically, I mentioned a great deal of that in our presentation here, because that is really fascinating. Um, we're seeing long collar syndrome. That's where people have experienced COVID and then months and months after they've had it, they still have signs and symptoms. And we think it may be due to autoimmunity. And on earth, women have more autoimmune diseases compared to men. So if we go into space, we know that we have suppression of the immune system, the bone marrow changes. And so we have to understand, does that put us at risk for developing uh, cancers and, and you know, relapse of infection? So we really have to take an understanding that this isn't about who's faster or better or smarter, just different so that we can develop the tools and the resources so we give everybody the most best beneficial opportunity to live and do their jobs well and safely in any environment. You bring up the word that I think that is kind of like one of those those moments where we all need to embrace it. That different isn't bad, right. it isn't absurd, it isn't something audacious, it just yeah. is. And that it's like me, I, again, if you and I were to have blood drawn right now, it's like all of a sudden I might be, you know, hypoglycemic or my thyroid might be under, you might be overreacting. So anywhere in those, that metabolic range, just for you and I, two women, fairly the same age range, we've never had children. So we have some things in common, but again, because we are not all the same metabolically or our endocrine systems work very differently. I, I just think it's very profound thing that we should all embrace this moment of different is good. It's like what makes me different adds to that thing of like, oh, we just figured out how to work on this for this astronaut. Let's do this for another or do that kind of like more personalized, specialized thing. And you are really getting at that when you're talking about precision innovation. Right. And my question is, does this go to personalized medicine and personalized everything that we can think about that would make 
whether it's me, like they even have said this darn MacBook Pro keyboard, everybody co uh, comments on it, that the newest keyboard is harder. You have to hit it harder. Mm -hmm. There's sometimes that I feel like I'm going to get out my hammer and like go start banging it. The darn thing won't work. Yeah. So all of these things matter because we want to be the most effective, but we sometimes tire out or get frustrated. So let's let's kind of break that down a little bit. When we talk about inclusion and diversity, I often see it as being invited to the dance, but when you are actually included, when you're asked to dance, then you really have achieved your goals. And we also want to ensure that you have the, the tools and the resources, so you have the shoes to dance. So that's just sort of a way to think about it. For example, when we talk about spacesuits, we knew that you just can't shrink them down. You have to really look at how the body interacts with the environment. And by doing that, you're able to develop a better fitting suit. You know, I've often been asked if, you know, do you really need diversity? In fact, I was asked that during the National Space Council meeting. And absolutely, the answer is absolutely, in the sense that with diversity, you have improved team performance, improved work performance, improved career satisfaction. You even improve the economic calculus of an organization, of a company. So everybody benefits. It's sort of like the rising tide, all ships rise. Everyone benefits. So as we look at the new technologies that we're developing, we have so many different resources at hand to look at innovations. So for example, through artificial intelligence, 3D printing, computational modeling, we can really move in that direction of precision innovation so that we provide individuals the tools that they need to be able to live and work well and safely in any environment. I'm going to invite a young uh, friend of ours. She's a junior at Portland uh, uh, State University, and her name is Nicole Henderson. Come on in, and we're going to invite you here. Uh, and uh, I'll ask for you to ask a question in just a minute. She's, I foresee her being one of your eye giant ambassadors very shortly. We do have a couple of comments here in the chat. Um, our fantastic supporter, Jack, says that his wife is a doctor and practice at practices at the Kaiser facility uh, mm -hmm. where you once practiced. Mm -hmm. And uh, Elena is apparently very, very excited that uh, that you are giving this space medicine talk. She feels like space uh, advocacy groups do not always give enough time or attention. So Jack, always thank you for watching and being here. And Elena, we're trying to meet your, uh, meet your requests as well. Uh, we have someone else, Janine, thank you for your talk. She's talking about being a victim of poor seatbelt design and she's and suffered neck injuries because it was attached to the side column too high and everything like that. So how, how can people participate or how can they change these things? I know you're on the forefront of this, but what do you need from all of us listening to you to, to enact or to request these things? Well, I think, first of all, we have to become aware, just as what you're doing with Explore Mars and Janet's Planet, by raising these issues and having people become aware that there are differences. I think we We've all too often just accepted that the way something is is the way it is and you can't change it. We know we can. So I encourage all members of your audience to participate in roundtables. Anyone can host them. iGiant will provide you the tools, will provide you the, the toolkit. So all you have to do is invite your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues, and we will even lead it for you. Because I think once you have awareness, I always say once, once you see the world through a sex gender lens, you can never go back again. It's just, I see the universe through the prism a space using a sex gender lens. And to me, it just adds incredible granularity and clarity. And we want everyone to do that. I think the other thing that we can do is, is engage, especially our students in our challenge competitions. I want people to begin thinking early on. So we host challenge competitions. So if we have organizations and companies out there and agencies, host challenge competitions with us. We, we have the template. We just need your audience. We need your constituents and we'll get those messages out. I think the other way we can do it is through our seal of approval. Uh, at Google last year, we launched our iGiant seal of approval for the IT sector. And it's been absolutely fascinating to see companies look at their design processes and see what they can do. I've mentioned Dr. Burnett several times in my presentation because she was really just has been an amazing leader to help us see the world through a gender mag program that she has 
so that we can see inherent bias that may be in software. And then you talked about some of the technologies. Well, that translates down. So we want to have seals of approval for every sector we're engaged in, the retail sector. Um, I just saw that BARDA has announced a challenge competition to look at the redesign of masks, which I'm really happy to see, not just to make them comfortable, but to make them safer. We know they do not fit women's faces. So again, I recommend all of you to go to the BARDA site, put your ideas and suggestions questions down. And then for our students out there, become youth ambassadors, become scholars and residents. Scholars and residents are for those who graduated from college, they may be in their postgrad or their early career years, and get engaged with us. Because again, everybody who understands these issues is a potential ambassador. And I think as we do that, we move the marketplace as well. When people see that by designing and looking at precision innovation, that you get a better fit, you get a better design, the public is happy, the public wants it. It really moves the value proposition, the business proposition of a company, and they see they need to do it. So for example, with our space sector, as we look at some of the clothing, as we look at some of the tools that we need for space exploration, I really encourage our commercial space partners to take a sex gender lens look and to do it early on. When we've held summits, for example, the one that we held at NASA, the engineers said, come to us early. When we're in that formative phase, it's much easier to design early on than to try to come back and retrofit and to make it right. So let's do it early on. I think again, for the space realm, it's really human systems integration. It's, as I mentioned early on, you know, I called it human factors, subpopulation, demographics, social determinants. It's the intersectionality of all that we are. And we need to look at human systems integration, not only, um, through engineering, our engineering divisions, but also clinical care. You mentioned precision medicine, and we're doing a better job of that today, especially with medications for even COVID, for example, um, as well as STEM and outreach and HR and research, really every division within an agency and organization company, we really need to ensure that there is a sex gender lens incorporated into the plan. Uh, Nicole, as our kind of like young college student, I'm sure you have a question. What do you want to do? Uh, first, I'm going to say, Dr. Mark, thank you so much for sharing your perspective and your knowledge with us. It's very inspiring and very interesting to hear, you know, everything that you know and that you've learned through your experiences. Uh, my question is, what is the biggest challenges that you believe um, limit furthering innovation through the gender sex lens within the space industry specifically? Well, I think one of the challenges is that I've often been told is it's too expensive or that we don't have enough time or there really isn't enough people to do the effort. And I say, no, that's really not the case. Um, and we have seen that it doesn't also have to be used as a form of discrimination. I know people want to fit in, but we're in a world of precision now. And so we can develop the tools and we can develop the resources, which really broaden everyone's opportunities. So I think we have to change that mindset. Uh, when you look at our Apollo program, we, we individually handled what we needed to do with spacesuits and, and with training. And again, it's not to, to discriminate, it's just to take advantage of what each individual brings to the table so you can do the best you can. I think as I have seen that when we have had these roundtables, companies that have participated, we have a corporate advisory council. At the end of the day, they realize how important this is for their business plan because they, they do better. So for example, in the pharmaceutical realm, if you see that you have a medication, you appropriately dose it, then you have less side effects and you have greater efficacy. Uh, when you have tools that you're using, for example, in the construction realm, um, they have a better fit and people are more inclined to come and wanna buy that product because it actually works for them. So we see everyone benefits and, and men benefit too. At one of our first round tables, it was a transportation round table. And we had someone from the trucking industry and she described that after when NAFTA passed, that a lot of the men didn't want uh, the jobs to go across the border. So they got their female partners on board and they found that they had to redesign uh, the, the trucks to make them safer, to change the cockpit, to make it easier to fix the engine. And they found everybody benefited. So I think as we take that deeper dive into the world of precision innovation, we see that everyone will benefit. We have to become aware and we'll find that it actually is more cost-effective, it is more efficient and everybody is happier. 
Now we had a question and several questions come in. I want to go to Lindsay's question, but because I think I heard you say the word non-binary at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. But her question is yes. this, in this research, are genders beyond male and female binary considered? How, what in, in the way that I, Giant, and you're looking at this as a health professional, how yeah. are you looking at that? Yeah, so thank you so much for bringing that up. And I brought it up at the start that I really want all of us to take a non-binary approach. One of our roundtables that we had at Indiana University, we had an ambassador who was from the ACLU and she was a, a trans woman. And she described that when she went into the shoe department, she wanted to buy clothing and shoes that fit her, but they weren't designed for the way she walked or for the size of her foot. So that was, a you know, an, nobody had really thought about it around the table. And again, that light bulb moment. We certainly see it in precision medicine. I'm an endocrinologist, so hormones are very much in my toolbox. And we have to appreciate, you know, the full spectrum of who we are. Um, again, I think by raising these issues, we can hopefully diminish discrimination and expand awareness. Again, going back to that whole issue of providing those resources and tools and opportunities for everyone. And again, just going back to realizing that every everybody's a little bit different. Nicole, across the spectrum, great aunt. Ah, uh, have that next question you see there. Nicole? Uh, yes, uh, I think Dr. McCarty sort of covered this, but Janine was asking, what is the cost implications for different design changes? And will businesses use the bottom line as an excuse for discrimination? Yeah, so it often the economic um, mindset has sometimes diminished the ability for people to be creative. And what we found with the iGiant seal of approval, that as companies actually looked at a sex gender process right at the beginning, they actually found that it improved their bottom line because their products were really developed in a way that met the needs of all the community. There were individuals who were more inclined to buy them. So there might be initially a little bit of an upfront cost to raise awareness and to look at the, the design pat process, but you save at the end. Again, improving the economic calculus. You know, it doesn't behoove anybody to have a product that doesn't fit the way your body moves or a medication for the way your body metabolizes. So it's really important to do this upfront, to do it at the beginning. And if you haven't done it, don't be discouraged in the sense that you may not have been aware of it. I think people have just accepted that this is the way it's been. So this is the way it needs to be. Well, we now know that's not the case. So I'm hoping that as we raise awareness through these type of sessions, through all our various roundtables, we've had thousands and thousands of ambassadors across the globe, that we will move the bar forward so that we realize precision innovation cuts across every sector and sex and gender is certainly one of those human factors that we need to assess early on so that we can do the best that we are able to do with the tools that we need to do those jobs. And I think I've shared this with Dr. Mark. She happened to speak to my student students, uh, I guess it was probably last August, September. And uh, one gal really heard you. She went into an old Navy and was really saddened by the fact that all of the NASA shirts were in the boy sections mm -hmm. and none were in the girl shirts. So she really heard you and Abby wrote to uh, the CEO of Old Navy and I will be doggone. So shout out to Old Navy. The CEO of Old Navy sent her uh, some some NASA like shirts and everything and said, we've heard you and we're going to be moving some product into the girls area. So it's something even right. as simple as that, as that we think about. And I loved your line about pink it and shrink it. Mm -hmm. I have to say, so I hope I don't offend anybody out there. My favorite color is not pink ever. <laughs> so it's kind of like, it's like, there's always this a little bit. It's like, what do you, why do you got to make it pink? Like I, you know, I like purples and blues or whatever. So there's a bit of me that nearly gets offended. Oh, this is for a woman. It's pink. And I'm like, how about I like other colors? So even silly things like that. But in your world, like, can you describe how you would, those human support systems, whether it's inside the command capsule or it's in the lander or it's in the habitat on the moon or Mars, what are your hopes for those places, Dr. Mark? Well, you know, as you were talking, Janet, I was thinking of the words from one of our premier fighter pilots who said she exposed, ex experienced emotional, physical, and spiritual harm trying to do her job. And the amount of time she wasted trying to retrofit her equipment 
So I was really heartened by the, the military last year, really looking at some of their equipment and their flight suits, for example, so that they could do redesigns so that everyone could do their jobs better. I think as we look at our habitats, we need to see what we need to be able to interact with our environments. I mean, we're all living at home now, and I certainly notice, you know, just even in, in my kitchen, why are things so high up and why are shelves so difficult to maneuver? Or when I'm using some of my power tools, does it fit the grip of my hand? And um, my own protective equipment, I certainly notice it doesn't fit me. I'm very concerned about that, for example, the N95 mask. So I think as we look at our habitats on Earth and on the moon and in our space station and certainly on the way to Mars and on Mars, we need to assume that everyone's going to react differently and we need to test it, not just using the male model, but really looking across the board, looking at how men and women, that non-binary approach can interact with equipment, with our clothing, with our tools. Uh, men and women perspire differently. So our liquid cooling garments, um, how are they designed to meet the needs of those and of individuals who are doing extreme, extreme activity? Um, our training protocols, women have different centers of gravity, may not necessarily be an issue as you're in the microgravity environment, the microcosm of space, but when you go to even a partial gravity environment, how does that influence? So when you're able to ambulate on a planet, so we have to look at this. And then as the body adapts, having that modular approach so that we you know, provide the lens for your eyesight as your body adapts um, with, with gravity, lack of gravity, you have spacesuits that are used to protect you and men and women adapt differently. So I think we, we have to be aware of it. And then the other part is even communication. Men and women communicate differently. Uh, we see the world differently. Um, and again, taking even the non-binary approach and being you know, cognizant of that so that we provide you know, behavioral health aspects so that people can communicate and interface in environments that are very challenging um, and do it in a way that everyone benefits. My, uh, Nicole, do you have another question? I know that I do. If you have a question, I'll let you go and then I'm going to have one on the heels of yours. I do. Um, another question that I have kind of relating and stemming from that, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mark, is are there any technologies that we're still lacking uh, that we need to really focus on developing in order to um, push that innovative design for space? Well, again, I think what we have to do, what I'd like to see happen is we've had two decadal reviews and I would like to go back and see uh, the recommendations from the last review, which was conducted in 2012, published in 2014. What did we accomplish from it? What have we learned? Where do we need to go? We're looking at the Artemis program. We're looking at a shorter time frame to hopefully visit and go back to the moon and, and have a woman land on that surface. So I like for us to see from our decadal review, what have we accomplished? Where do we need to go? What, which partners do we need to bring on board that haven't been there? Um, and do it in a sense that it's translational, not just an academic exercise, but really look at these issues and look at it from the translational aspect. You know, we have the Translational Research Institute on Space Health, which has done a really wonderful job of putting that mindset of taking from the, the bench to quote unquote, the bedside to, to the environment you're operating in, and how do we accelerate that process? So through iGiant, we have looked at tools to accelerate, and now we have the opportunity working with our agencies and with our academic centers and our corporate partners and our NGOs to really accelerate the process of looking at design elements through a sex gender lens. My question is, of all the lessons we've learned here, in the pandemic, having our own kind of personal analogs, uh, <laughs> kind of correlating with how maybe some isolation goes on yeah. the station and in space flight. What are the lessons that you think are, are, have been the most helpful that we can go, oh, after a long period of isolation, people begin to really, really kind of have some degradation of behavioral qualities perhaps, or it's because they need to be with people or the isolation moment has gotten to be too great. What are some things you, you think we've learned from the pandemic that can also help this uh, kind of precision innovation as we go forward? Yeah, and Jen, it's such an important question. I, I actually wrote an article for one of the lay press looking at lessons learned from the space program, because there are quite a few. You talked about isolation. 
um, you know, you, you talk about having scheduling in a day. I know men and women react differently to isolation, and I think it's important to understand that. I think, you know, we, we know the behavioral health aspects are, are critical. They're critical to the success of any mission. They're critical to the success of how we live our lives uh, here on Earth. I think what's also interesting is the body adapts in space. So that's, you know, we, we have been talking about COVID and losing the sense of smell and taste. Well, in space, you may have that as well as there's cephalic distribution of, of fluid and, and taste and smell may be impaired. And we know eating is so important, not only for our physical well-being, but also our psychological well-being. And understanding those differences will be very, very important. Um, and, and interacting in this virtual environment, I, I thank goodness we have it, but I know we're also frustrated by it. So what do we need to do to develop technologies that we have that tactile sensation, that haptic sensation, so that we feel more connected to each other from a you know, humanity perspective? And I certainly think, you know, our, our protective equipment, um, I, I was thinking about it last night. When I went down to Antarctica, I was told I was going to be given PPE that would fit me. And when I arrived, I was given a small, small size boots, and gloves, and jacket, but it was for men. And I looked at some of the pictures last night, and I, I'm amazed that I was able to ambulate to get around. I looked, first of all, like a giant penguin um, <laughs> with the orange boots in my black and white jacket. But... I didn't have technology that really worked for me. So every time that I had to get dressed to go out, I really did not look at it with joy because it was uncomfortable. I wasn't able to do what I needed to do. And I think that plays a role. So it really comes even down to that minutia. We need to be able to really pr do precise innovation to the tools we need, to the opportunities and to train us well to do it. We, we each come to a task differently. And now I think we are able to define how we can interact with the environment a little better. So th these are important lessons. We're all living in this giant laboratory right now. And we can translate these lessons to what we need to do to the other extreme environment, and that is space exploration. All right, Nicole, I'm gonna let you take this last question uh, that we have gotten from Allison Robinson. Will you please uh, moderate that question for Absolutely. us? Absolutely. So Allison asked Dr. Mark, when it comes to human spaceflight systems, do you think private organizations like SpaceX or Blue Origin are better equipped for precision innovation compared to other companies like NASA? Mm, that's a, a really good question. Well, first of all, I think you need a public-private partnership. You can't do anything alone. And it's the public-private partnerships that we have seen that have really accelerated the progress for COVID and certainly for space exploration. I think each one brings their own assets to the table. And it's not really, you know, just like, again, not who's better or faster or smarter in regard to sex gender. It's the same thing with these different types of stakeholders. So it's understanding how to work together, how to complement each other. I think what they have done, the commercial space sector has done, has been truly extraordinary this year. But it's also working with the agencies to get there. So it's, it's that hand and glove approach. And I am really excited that we are democratizing space. I hope every one of us will have an opportunity to experience microgravity, to, to visit the moon to reach for the stars. And it's gonna require the commercial space sector working with our agencies to do that. And I look forward to working with everyone to help achieve that goal. All right, we've got, uh, we will, we've got a, one more question we're just trying to sneak in. Do you see AI as helping that iterative uh, kind of design process or helping some of those uh, behavioral things and tactile things we need? Do I see AI doing that? Absolutely, absolutely. And or I think VR, those kinds. Of yeah, things. VR, MR, all our all our tools, our technologies that we have. But again, I, I want to have the audience go to Gender Mag. Just look it up. Dr. Burnett's really pivotal research because we see there's inherent bias in a lot of these technologies. They're not designed often for the way a female brain may operate or hand-eye coordination or even how to read facial features. So I think it's important that we understand the inherent bias in these technologies. I know Explore Mars hosted a summit about a year or two looking at this. Um, we know that the UN has certainly done that. A lot of our partners are doing that. So we have to understand it. I mean, we see it with electronic medical record where there's greater burnout for women. 
because it's not designed for the way a woman processes information. Even some of our virtual reality technology, we've seen greater incidence of, of headaches in women. Again, that the processing of information and how the design is, is really not for a female brain or even female size of the head. So when we use these technologies, they are a gift, but we also have to really go back and look at some of the inherent gender bias in the initial design and processing so that we make sure that they fit the needs of everyone who needs to use them in every and any environment. And I cannot think of a better sentence to close our fantastic session out. We thank you, uh, student Nicole Henderson, who I should mention is uh, studying math and physics. So uh, I believe you may have your thesis just kind of right here before you. Uh, again, we want to say thank you to everybody who joined us today. Please join us next uh, Tuesday for Drinks with Explore Mars at 8 p.m. Most importantly, find a way to join with us as we celebrate this green run test for SLS on Saturday. Again, uh, it, it will be a real historic moment that gets us ever closer to the moon and Mars. And so we are wishing all of the engineers great luck. Most of all, I want to say thank you to all of our great sponsors, all of our great attendees. Thank you for your fantastic questions. But most importantly, to my dear friend, Dr. Sarah Lynn Mark, we are all better and more informed and are thinking about things in a different way because you are here. And so we are very grateful. Everybody, we say thank you from Explore Mars. If you find ways that you want to support or volunteer or help out or have, and even want to recommend a webinar that you would like to hear, uh, please let us know. Thank you again and have a great afternoon.